Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our session, Do Internet Services Deserve a Syntax? My name is Deborah Brown. I work with the Association for Progressive Communications, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, what hope it promise, has promised to be a, an exciting discussion. The taxation of popular internet services, including a various um, social media platforms and voice over IP calls, is becoming a more prevalent um, trend in many countries and regions. While the reasons and motivations for our taxes differ in each case, it is a worrying uh, trend that deserves more attention, um, including to the global implications and the risk of setting precedents for taxation and other regulations of internet services. For example, in developing regions like in Africa, these measures are imposed for a range of different reasons, um, ranging from the need to augment dwindling telco revenue, which is stifled dissent, or even gossip in different countries. Um, this has huge implications for digital inclusion, digital rights, and social and economic development. Policy proposal, proposals in other regions like Europe aim to enable fairer and more competitive digital economies by taxing internet conglomerates and companies um, that in which they operate, which aren't necessarily where they're domiciled. So this session will explore this trend. It aims to unpack different types of taxes, how they're structured, imposed, and levied, and whether internet services deserve a so-called syntax. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists. Our first speaker today is Dr. Allison Gilwald. She's the executive director of Research ICT Africa, an African digital policy and regulatory think tank, which works across 20 African countries. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Cape Town and supervises doctoral students, um, research in digital governance, policy, and regulation. And so over to you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Deborah. Let me get closer to this mic. <laughs> So um, I think it's important to understand the um, introduction of social networking taxes in the context of um, quite, uh, you know, uh, pernicious taxation um, in the context of rolling out services across the African continent, um, but also in the context of the political economy of the countries in which we are um, seeing the introduction of social networking taxes. So in many countries, um, developing countries and the least developed countries, the mobile network operations are sometimes really the only kind of um, company tax, that significant company tax that is coming into the fiscus and the exchequer. And therefore, um, it's often used um, in a quite rent extractive way to um, deal with um, loan repayments, debt repayments, and that kind of thing. Um, so, so many countries, although the uh, mobile operators, especially the, you know, the bigger cross-Africa um, um, operators, um, are quite profitable, they've been putting a significant amount of these um, investments back into network extension, which has obviously enabled you know, large numbers of people to come online. Um, obviously not always as cost-effectively um, as they might do, and there's sort of certainly um, you know, a, a large amount of um, profitability on their side that could come down, but it has had a critical function in, um, uh, in economic growth and in getting people um, online. So various countries have had already, you know, um, quite high by, by African standards and quite high by company tax standards of, you know, as much as 40% um, taxation of the operators, which is one of the contributors to the high prices um, where there's not very effective regulation. So those prices are obviously not carried by the operators themselves, those taxes, etc., cetera, are, are you know, put back into the costs of the organization. So we, I think it's important to understand um, the, the, the um, issues of taxation in terms of the political economy of the countries, the challenges they face, and also um, in the context of um, global platforms and the inability of governments to actually um, tax um, these large platforms that are generating revenues in countries, um, obviously at the national level, and therefore the need to explore um, more um, and perhaps we can discuss this later, but explore more the p possibilities of some of the global taxation regimes that are being proposed that would allow for um, the revenues that are generated in that country to be taxed um, either at that country's um, tax rate or, or at a flat rate. Um, but 
the 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 impact of social networking um, on uh, of these taxes on users is a highly highly retrogressive tax. So this very small, what seems like a very small 0.5% um, US cent tax um, daily on certain networks, on certain platforms, I should say, sorry, um, is actually an, enor an enormous part of the um, income of the people have, you know, discretionary income that people have to, to spend on communications. And we see the implications of this um, with the um, a drop in a country like Uganda, for example, significant um, decline in um, data use and, of course, in revenues, which raises the question of, you know, the, the purpose of the tax because, you know, it, it, it is highly, besides being retrogressive, being, you know, a double hardship on the poor, it's also irrational. Um, the tax is meant to generate income for, for debt repayment, is, is the explanation given for it. Um, at the same time, it's actually pushing people offline and reducing the revenues that the co mobile companies are operating. So it's not actually effective, you know, it's not driving the kind of um, uh, rents that they are hoping to extract from, from that process. It's not, it's not sort of having that effect. Um, and on the other hand, it's really working you know, effectively like you would use for a syntax. It's, a, it's, it's like a tax you would use for tobacco or something where you're trying to dissuade people um, from, from doing a certain thing. Um, and in that sense, it is, it is irrational and very contradictory um, because in the Uganda case specifically, the Gazette actually refers to the need to stop gossiping. Um, in actually the, the, the regulation actually refers to this. So it's, as I said, it's got this economic imperative which is being undermined by, um, by actually reducing the, 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 the use in the way it's, it, it's applied. And then it has this um, social aspect which needs to be understood not only as a kind of moral, um, a kind of gossiping thing, but very much as the intersection really of um, rent extraction with social control. Um, I think for the first time in, in, in many of the taxes that we've seen, um, because we know from the Uganda household surveys that the people who are online, the, you know, the significant number of, the, of people who are online are young urban youth, um, so people between 15 and, and 30. And um, these are also known to be the um, people who are involved with in, in, in social and political dissent. So certainly this taxation is, is, is aimed, I would think, um, and I'm sure Juliet will have some points to comment on this, are, are, you know, are aimed at that as well. So trying to achieve really contradictory um, um, outcomes with the, with, the, with the taxation. And of course, um, first introduced in, in, in Uganda, it was introduced, um, or they attempted to introduce it at a very similar time um, in Benin, uh, absolutely remarkable uh, civil society response to that literally brought um, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people onto the street and within days the um, intended taxation was withdrawn by the, by the government. Um, of course, the East African um, region is, is very integrated, East African community, um, and at this very shortly after Uganda, or maybe it was actually even a similar time, um, we had the introduction of a um, blogger's tax of $900, so a blogger's license effectively, um, in Tanzania. Um, again, very much aimed at managing political um, dissent at the then reasonably new administration, but it already made um, certain, um, you know, political um, um, repressive moves um, over a period of time. So, um, I th you know, I think that's, as I said, I think what would be important, I'll, I'll end off there so some other people can, can comment, but I, what I really would like us to come back to is, you know, if we go to, um, you know, at the, t at the same time that this tax was being introduced in Uganda, we were working with the South Af with the um, Ugandan government on the digital Uganda, this vision for Uganda to, you know, um, you know, go entirely digital. Um, at, and at the same time, we were actually, you know, very shortly thereafter, the social networking tax was pushing um, these large numbers of people basically off, off, the, off the network. So as much as a 30% reduction in data um, usage and associated revenues um, over the last year that we've seen, we've had this um, taxation um, in place. 
So to engaging with the, I mean, you know, as I said, there is a kind of irrationality. You've got a policy where you're trying to bring people online. You engage with the government in that, relation, in that regard. The policy makers in this area, are, obviously there's a tension with the um, finance departments or the treasuries that are, you know, completely, <laughs> um, sort of, quite honestly, don't seem to get it. So, um, I th you know, I think, I think we need to engage from a policy point of view if we want to... Um, um, in, assist governments get legitimate taxation from very profitable businesses, including um, platforms, um, then we need to explore these ways in which they can um, levy or receive um, the, the, the appropriate taxation from um, big companies, platforms that are generating um, you know, revenues in their jurisdictions. Thank you, Alison. I think you raised some very thought-provoking points there, and just the contradiction of um, imposing taxes to generate debt repayment and revenue for the governments that are actually disincentivizing people from using those exact platforms. So you have to wonder if um, these types of taxes are actually operating as sin taxes and if that's actually beneficial to societies. Uh, our next speaker, I think, will build on some of the same cases and analysis is uh, Michael Kendi, who's a senior advisor at Analysis Mason and a senior advisor to the World Bank. And he's been teaching a course in internet economics at the Graduate Institute for the past four years and has done a significant amount of work in this area, including recently published a paper called The Impact of Taxation on Social Media in Africa. So Michael, please tell us some more. Great, um, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I th I'll just build on with some numbers on what um, the cases that Allison was talking about, particularly in Uganda. but. Uh, so we were asked to do a, a report on a number of these taxes that were coming up um, in, in Africa uh, on both uh, the social media and, and more generally over-the-top internet services for the reasons mentioned here, raising revenue, uh, reducing gossip, and in the case of internet calls, the idea is to, um, that it's, it's a way of getting the revenue back for the for the telephone operators that are losing revenues to Skype or to other over-the-top uh, calling services or messaging. Uh, so we looked at five countries. The report is available online. It's called Background on Taxation of Internet Access and Content Services. And if you give me your card, I'd, I'd happily send you the link. Um, but we looked at a new excise tax in, tax in Kenya on internet data. Uh, Zambia, Cameroon, and, and as mentioned, Benin uh, talked about imposing taxes um, on internet calls. Uh, in Cameroon, it was going to be on the download of foreign of apps that weren't created in Cameroon. Uh, when we wrote the paper, those two hadn't been implemented. In Benin, it was overturned. But the one in Uganda, which was five cents a day for the use of social media, um, was imposed on, on the 1st of July uh, 2018, and, and Juliet may be able to comment a bit on the, the, polit the politics and, and what went around it, but I'll just talk a little about the economics. So in Uganda, affordability was already low. You know, there's this target of 2% of uh, income on for a, a one gigabyte of, of data. Um, per month, and here it was around 6% of average daily revenue, a uh, healthy chunk of which was the, so the, the taxes on the mobile operators was about 30% of average usage. Um, and with this new social media tax, that took affordability to 7.8% of average income, uh, so quite, quite a bit higher. Um, and of course, like every country, social media was being used broadly, not just for gossip, uh, in, used loosely, but people use it for, uh, for selling things. Uh, you know, people use Facebook for selling, for classified ads, job searches, uh, businesses use it as well. Government, most of, in all of the countries we looked at, the, 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 the leader of the government has their own Twitter or Facebook or some social media accounts, so everyone is using it. Um, and what was interesting, I think, about this one is um, that these services are free. Um, so it's not a case of adding a 10% tax on uh, excise tax on mobile data because you can't tax something that's free at any percent. 
uh, obviously, because that would still be zero. Um, so you have the problem of how are you going to tax it and who, how are you going to impose the tax. And in this case, it was imposed that, this, um, that the mobile operators would charge the tax, and um, if you paid it for that day or for that month, then they would allow you to use uh, social media for that period of time. So it all went through the mobile operators who had this additional burden um, because, of course, the social media companies had no way of uh, charging for uh, using the services since they weren't charging. Um, and the result is that, I mean, this is kind of where the economics comes in. It turns out that having something free, not surprisingly, is a very special price. And there's a lot of behavioral economics and People are winning Nobel Prizes now. Economists are winning Nobel Prizes for studying this because they do experiments and find out that if you drop a price down to free, it increases demand much, much more than you would expect. Uh, you can have two things at you know, different prices and people might like the more expensive one, uh, but if you drop the price of the cheaper one down to zero, even if you have the price differences the same, uh, people will take the free one. They don't have to dip into their pocket. They don't make a commitment. They just, this experiment is with chocolate, but the, the general uh, trend holds that free is a very special price and imposing a small price on something that's free makes people suddenly think about making a commitment. Uh, of course, there's the, re there's the cost as well, but um, it's not just affordability. There's something psychological going on. And indeed, um, Within three months, the results were out, um, and um, there was a 15% fall in internet subscriptions because people were using the internet for social media, and if they didn't want to use social media, some of them just gave up. And a 30% drop in, ta in the tax, so it started out at whatever level of tax, and, and they lost 30% of the tax revenues that they expected within three months because people were using the internet yes, less, using social media less. Um, and so that's quite a problem for the finances, right? Because they were making money off the data and now they were selling less, the mobile operators were selling less data so there was less revenue off of that. Uh, the social media companies, some of them were making money off of advertising and of course there's going to be less of that. There is the challenge, which I'm sure we'll talk about, of taxing the, the global companies for their revenues in a particular country, but the sum was a lot less revenue, and then of course the users were using it less and they were generating less economic uh, benefits as well. So we just kind of concluded in the paper that if you look at the, any kind of principles of taxation, it's a very regressive tax because it's the same on everybody, so for, for those less well off it, it, hit, it hits harder. In this case, it was relatively, for some people, it was easy to avoid. Uh, if you, it turns out if you used Wi-Fi or a VPN, you could, you could get around the block on using it if you didn't pay the tax. So that generates a feeling of in, inequity that the technological haves can still use it without paying and the others are still paying this tax. It's a double tax because you're already paying to use the data and now you're paying an additional tax and all these other spillovers. Um, so we just thought, and, and we can discuss here, that better to generate as much economic activity as possible for the mobile operators, advertising revenues, for the people using social media for their business, and, and take a much broader but smaller tax a after the economic uh, activity has been stimulated rather than before and, and cutting it off. Thank you, Michael. And I think it's a very valuable perspective looking at, um, you know, the different economic cases and the, and I think your paper concluded that this, this type of tax um, is harmful and it falls short of internationally accepted digital taxation policies. And ABC issue, um, put out an issue paper earlier this year that looked at some of these taxes that concluded that it's actually inconsistent with international human rights law. So we see in different ways how these types of taxes are are new and they're not really rooted in traditional um, international norms. And I think Juliet will talk a little bit more about that and bring in the perspective. Um, I know she's been working on these issues quite closely in Uganda. Juliet Nanfuko works with the Collaboration for ICT Policy in East and Southern Africa, CPESA.
Um, she's involved in research and communications and project delivery in the organization and has a background in journalism and new media and has been really closely looking at these issues in Uganda and elsewhere in the region. Great, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we've spoken about the numbers, we've spoken about the various um, high level look or rather perspectives, um, but I just wanted to take it back to the human being behind the tax. Um, who is the person affected by the tax that we've been going on about? Um, and for a long time, when in the lead up to the discussion around the taxes in, and during the enactment of um, the Excise Duty Act, Amendment Act of 2018, the human being behind who would most likely be affected by the taxes fell short of the conversation or was largely left out of the conversation um, because they already weren't part of the conversation to start off with. And um, that is a community that has been further pushed away from the digital society, the online community, the opportunities afforded by being um, online. But um, that Excise Duty Act also introduced an increase in mobile money transactions. Um, so we have, um, I'm looking at the, talking um, to the case of Uganda. We have a tax introduced to social media, but also an increment in the transaction fees for, for mobile money. Mobile money is a, is a mobile, rather, well, mobile enabled platform um, for um, financial transactions. It is it has enabled the largely informal sector of the country to be part, or to have some kind of bankable um, approach to their financial um, services. So with the introduction of the taxes, we had an increment in the amount of money that people are gonna be spending to access their data, and largely affected were going to be women, um, persons with disabilities, and the youth. Um, the latter being quite a dominant um, a player in the Ugandan online arena. But when we look more closely, and these are figures coming from the Uganda Communications uh, Commission, the authority that regulates the, the sector, we found from the data themselves that with the introduction of the taxes a few months in, um, at least five mi million people dropped off. They either went offline completely or they turned to the use of VPN. So we went from having an inter internet penetration of 47%, um, down to 35%. Let me just make sure I'm giving you the right numbers. Yes, from 47% to 35%. And that was the equivalent of losing some 5 million people. Of those 5 million people were persons with disability. Um, again, UCC data revealed that at least 60% of the persons with disabilities in Uganda whom they have data on um, were largely affected by the social media taxes and at least 26% of the community stopped using um, social media. And when we look a bit deeper into that, we find that this is a community that was relying on social media for basic access and communication. Um, if someone is unable to walk, it's a simple mobile message or rather WhatsApp message or Facebook message away from one service or the other. Um, but also their financial transac transactions were largely affected or largely done on mobile money. Um, and this is a community that is already largely affected by financial exclusion. Um, there's a very cultural or the deep, a deeply rooted exclusion of um, persons with disabilities in the country. So they're, not, they're less likely to get access to jobs, they're less likely to get basic education, so their struggles are on very many fronts, and the taxes, both sides, on social media and mobile money, did not help them much. So um, we now have them needing to seek much more money to do basic mobile money transactions, and again, a whole lot more money to access mobile money, I mean, rather social media. And that's a community whose plight went largely unrecognized when we're talking about uh, mobile money transactions, or rather the mobile the social media tax. Um, of course, the women, um, also another vulnerable group who are affected by the taxes, similar to persons with disabilities, they're largely, they're likely rather to not have as much economic opportunity as um, men in the country, even though they're the larger percentage of the population in comparison to men. Um, but um, for across all groups, women, youth, and personal 
and persons with disabilities, there's also the issue of local content. Social media has been a platform where people have found content relevant to their interests, their needs, their languages, a whole lot more readily available than in the broader internet. And this is why social media has also ended up being an entry, an entry point and a staying point for many people um, when it comes to internet use. The larger internet arena does not readily speak to their needs, their content interests, and um, their more local, local desires. Um, and that was more readily found on social media platforms. So we see uh, a missed opportunity in the generation of uh, content more relevant to um, communities. We see a missed opportunity in promoting a culture of inclusion particularly in a time when it was mentioned earlier that many states are talking about digital inclusion, digital visions, and digital transformation. Um, so what are we doing all of this for when we are working towards excluding communities from the very opportunities that we as a government are trying to promote? Um, so that is largely the language that we're seeing. We're including, but we're also excluding at the same time, a very mixed um, persona that, that is coming through. So in that case, we are creating a rather negative perception around the taxes. Earlier mentioned was also the language used when the taxes were introduced. It was introduced as something to curb gossip, but was it? A few days later, the language used was that it was, the taxes were to grow the tax base. So rather mixed messaging coming from the state, but the popular narrative that is sometimes used is it's, 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 it's a good text to have because there's too much gossip going on, taking place online. And that is shaping people's perceptions of the online arena and it's fueling some of the arguments against being online. Um, so very dangerous um, uh, speech or perceptions being shaped by the language of the leaders. Um, again, to the detriment of the whole vision of what the internet could potentially be and should be. But also, another community I didn't mention is the refugee community in the country, which is quite large, and whose needs are often left out of the discussions when we talk about digital rights. Um, but in an era where, in the region, we've got countries like um, the Sudan, Eritrea, with communities hopping between countries, left, right, and center, often being caught in a state of statelessness because of the absence of um, having a national ID, because they, they, they don't quite belong here nor there. Um, they are also then left out of the basic mobile money transaction economy and also sometimes excluded from having basic access to social media tax. That's, in order to access the tax anyway, one has to have a mobile money account. And to have a mobile money account, one has to part with a lot of personal data in order to get a national ID. Um, even though we have a Data Privacy and Protection Act, um, there's still many questions around it. It's great to have it, but we need to see some of the guarantees, the safety guarantees around it implemented a whole lot more readily so, particularly in a time when there's a whole lot of very strong perceptions around surveillance and that is also fueling a culture of censorship and self-censorship. Um, so very, it's a very intertwined argument that we have around um, the narratives or what is shaping the language around social media tax in Uganda. And that is something that we're seeing in other countries um, such as Tanzania, which has online regulations. Um, again, uh, excluding people from online content generation, but also shaping a rather negative perception about being um, online. Anyway, so what we're seeing is um, the tax is being used as a form of dissuading the consumption or rather the, the use of social media, which is rather contradictory to what the state has for many years been claiming its goals to be. But beyond that is also another avenue of preventing too many questions being asked of the state. Um, and we can look at this through the lens of um, transparency. So we're collecting all these extra taxes, but what are we doing with them? What have we done with the previous taxes that have been collected? 
Um, so don't ask questions like that. It might be gossip. Don't, you know, don't, <laughs> don't, don't ask too many questions. Um, that is one of the undercurrents of um, the introduction of the various forms of online um, content regulations, including through the so social media taxes. Gossip comes in many forms. Sometimes it's in the form of questions. Sometimes it's in the form of poetry, <laughs> as we've seen with the Stella Nyanzi. Um, so very dangerous undercurrents come alongside the introduction of um, syntaxes. <laughs> uh, many questions around that as well. Um, but one of them, what we, rather what we need to, to really keep in mind is that other countries don't take heed of this. It's great to see that Benin pushed back against it. But we have countries like Zambia, which has a voice over um, IP, which, which um, is, as, is which, whose argument is to collect the monies lost by traditional telephone calls. But nonetheless, the argument for economy, econ economics over human beings is one that really needs to be reconsidered. Um, when we talk that data is a new oil, for example, we really take the human being out of the whole argument around digital rights. And um, the human being needs to, be, needs, to be, uh, a whole lot, needs to come out a whole lot stronger when we talk about social media tax. Who is the person affected by this? How and why? Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. I'm sure there's a lot of questions for you. I know I have a few, but I think let's move on to the final speaker before opening up the floor. Um, our final speaker is Franz von Weizsäcker, who is heading the Tech and Innovation Lab at uh, GIZ, um, the German International Development Agency, if I got that right. Um, he's advising governments and business organizations worldwide on digital strategy, digital economic policy, cybersecurity, smart cities, among other issues. And Franz has been looking at this issue from the perspective of what work going on in the OECD and G20, and I think can give some important um, reflections on conversations in those arenas. All right, thank, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I would say uh, tax is a necessary evil, uh, unfortunately, and it causes harm in most places where it appears, and most parts of the economies which are taxed uh, do experience some form of damage or negative impact through taxation. So now the question is, what form of taxation is the one with least collateral damage, you could say? And um, of course, so, so in that context, uh, GIZ is advising approximately 30 governments worldwide on uh, domestic revenue um, 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 mobilization. So basically generating these revenues, which are to some extent necessary for statehood. I'm not saying that all the spendings are spent for a very good thing, but of course, um, without having any tax revenues, there is only very few countries that have the luxury of having uh, maybe enough oil or other resources to be able to have zero taxes, but, um, but most do require taxation. So therefore, I would argue we need taxation, and probably most of the form of the social media ta taxation that I've seen uh, here that you've been reporting on might have more collateral damage than other forms of taxation. But we, we must admit, I mean, governments are struggling these days. Governments are struggling with generating the necessary tax revenues because there is a lot of uh, erosion of the tax base. Essentially, it, it often has to do with large, uh, large multilateral corporations um, that uh, move, that are shifting their profits abroad, and therefore all you can tax is the profit, and that leaves uh, many economies uh, deprived of taxation, and including Inside European Union, we are struggling with this phenomenon. If you look at uh, the company Google, um, basically an advertising company to a large degree, uh, generating their revenues uh, uh, to be taxed uh, in Ireland uh, with a tax rate of less than 1%. And that's, of course, uh, um, a situation that is not, uh, not very um, fortunate uh, for, for the economies affected where the revenues are actually, actually generated. Now, the entire, on, on the entire world, the taxation regime has a long history of taxing only companies where they are based physically. And uh, that's quite a tricky thing to overcome that lo long heritage. And that, this is exactly why I believe we need international cooperation. Um, there has been, there's a very good uh, international club of 134 company, uh, countries, sorry, countries, um, who are joining the inclusive framework uh, 
uh, for uh, against tax-based erosion and profit shifting. So the BEPS, it's a four-letter word, very ugly phenomenon of, of the, of the uh, economy in general, but in particular of the digital economy. And uh, so this OECD and G20-led club of countries is basically looking for new ways now uh, to deal with the digital economy where there is no physical uh, uh, representation of that company in the economies affected. Um, now, there will be two core questions to be addressed. Uh, one is, what is the revenue base, first of all, because you can only, let's say, if, if Google is based in Ireland and there is a certain revenue generated in, in Germany, so you only want to, I mean, the, the general consensus is you can only tax uh, uh, companies that generate significant reg revenue in your country, you typically large uh, international uh, internet companies, uh, so, and how do you measure that? So that's the one question at hand that needs to be addressed. And the other question is, how do you measure where the profit is made? Because uh, after all, in those uh, economies affected, you might not have any actually economic activities in the narrow sense, but it's only the users and it's only their eyeballs affected, so to speak, whereas the customer is sitting somewhere completely different and uh, the company generating these revenues is also sitting somewhere else. So you need to find a way, how do you determine the, the profit allocation between the different economies uh, involved here. So that's a tricky one, a, a tricky question to be addressed uh, in the framework of the OECD proposal, which is currently under consultation. And um, I think we need to advance this course with a lot of uh, pressure in order to avoid uh, countries feeling pressure to, to generate tax revenues through other means. Because basically we need to advance the solution uh, because uh, uh, not being able to collect taxes is not an option. And, and therefore, therefore I, I, I strongly endorse uh, the push towards, towards this international cooperation uh, in that sense. I think that's it from my side. Thank you, Franz. Um, I'm wondering if there's any questions from participants. I see at least one. Others, please um, raise your hand and we'll come to you. And if you could please introduce yourself. Thanks. Hi, my name is Elena Sapong. I'm the Deputy Director and Policy Lead for the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Um, uh, FOEI, um, for short, is uh, an initiative of the Web Foundation. And we are the leading advocates for affordable broadband um, across the world. We are made up of uh, 80 plus members um, for government, civil society, and um, private sector. Um, the, the reason why I'm very happy that we're having this conversation because um, in the work that we do generally across uh, Asia, Latin America, and Africa, we've seen, particularly in Africa, we've seen the wave of um, uh, consumer-facing taxation, and we've always had an issue with that, and the work we did with CPES, I'm very happy to hear, uh, see Juliet here and uh, talking about the, um, some of the outcomes and the impact it's had on for some marginalized groups and women as well. But um, by conversation, uh, the question, it's more of a contribution actually, is on the, um, the gentleman from GIZ, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, I was in Paris last week for the, um, the OECD conversation on the unified pillar. And uh, I was quite concerned that there, were, there was one aspect that they were looking at consumer facing uh, aspects of taxation. And I had to stand up and speak about the, some of the outcome of the research that uh, from, from our work uh, with, with CEPESA and other organizations, the work we, our research on Benin and Tanzania and other countries. And uh, it, it was quite, um, I would say a lot were not familiar with that. And so I had an issue with the uh, definition of or what, how they were defining consumer facing uh, taxation. The other thing was that I also didn't see a lot of representation of uh, various African um, reps in that place. So I think when we're talking about this conversation, I really encourage that we, we have a lot more um, input from various stakeholders because the implications, uh, companies that are operating in these places, even though are global, but uh, the decisions and the impact they make is in on, a, on a local level. Thank you. We'll take a few more, and I know, know that was more of a contribution than a state uh, question, but in case anyone would like to respond to that. Um, I see two hands on this side of the room, so I'll do um, a round of questions and then a round of responses. 
from and introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello. My name is Beatrice. I work for the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, which is a commission on digital technologies and inclusive growth. Um, I think that that made me the issue with taxing companies that are not based in the country, they don't have a physical footprint in the country, is not new. It didn't come with the digital economy. I think it's an issue that was brought by globalization. So uh, the issue of taxing tech companies or digital companies like the MNS MNES model, but on asteroids, uh, data and digital technologies make it even more pervasive with the model where companies are not based in the countries they operate. And what we have seen at our work at the Pathways Commission is that many countries are concerned with the fact that these big tech companies come to the country, harness the data from their users, uh, have this big data the database, they make millions and billions of dollars out of it, and the countries get nothing. So uh, on the one hand, uh, I, I understand the point from the gentleman uh, that tax is not good and that and taxes uh, are an evil somehow. But on the other hand, uh, developing countries in, in particular, they use the revenues from the tax to improve services, to improve like hospitals and education, and they need the revenue somehow. So even though some of the uh, measures that are being applied to tax these companies are uh, very below uh, the optimal uh, measure, quite blunt somehow, like the Uganda example is one of them. I think the developing countries specifically are st struggling to tax these companies that are harnessing the data. And uh, while there's no perfect model, I'm a bit concerned, like the colleague uh, in the other, on the other side of the room, whether the OECD model, the OECD framework, is actually the better fit for many of the developing countries that are struggling with that. I think in, in, in certain ways, there's a concern of whether uh, the model imposed by OECD countries that come from a different background and have a different institutional setting would be the best fit for many of the countries that are struggling with these very pressing problems of companies coming to their countries, harnessing the data, creating the value, a digital value that we cannot really measure, and then going away without contributing to, to the society. I mean, it's again, it doesn't have a question mark at the end of my contribution, but as, as I think I was wondering, is the OECD the best framework for many of the developing countries? And is there an alternative model that developing countries can uh, maybe build together to, to tackle the problem. Thank you. There's another question on this side of the room, so please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Innocent Adriko. I am an ISOC IGF Youth Ambassador from Uganda. Uh, mine's more of a comment on the issue of the OTT tax in Uganda. So we do realize that, yes, the tax has uh, an impact on uh, negative impact anyway, on the number of uh, internet users. But then the question is, uh, we as the, the community, like the internet community, people who have something to do with uh, uh, discussing people who are here at the IGF, like what role do we have in ensuring that maybe we have something to do with uh, um, uh, talking to legislators, for example? Because when you do realize uh, I don't think there's any Ugandan legislator at the forum here, because if there was one, maybe I would be engaging the legislator on some of these issues personally, but unfortunately there's none. So what do we do? Because if there's no legislator here and, he's, uh, and he could be having uh, clear answers to, to some of these issues, to some of uh, uh, the reasons as to why the tax is there, and then... What can we do? Thank you. And how do we see that uh, uh, more governments do not adopt to such kind of taxes? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to turn some of those comments into questions for the panelists. Um, so there was a question around, in the OECD context, how you're dealing with um, consumer-facing taxes and what sort of considerations go into that. So I think that would be a great question for Franz. If either of the pa other panelists have or responses around um, alternative models for um, countries in developing regions, that would be great to hear from. And then for Juliet, the last question I think would be great if you could address that and also tell us a little bit about um, some of the efforts to challenge the Ugandan law in court. Thanks. <laughs> 
All right. So, so I think actually my, my claim was that um, if we want to avoid uh, the harmful effects that you've mentioned around taxation, which are mostly related to consumer-facing taxes, uh, then we have to generate an effective regime of generating uh, tax revenues in some other ways. And, and there is a number of ways how to raise uh, domestic uh, uh, resource mobilization. One of them is being introducing mobile payment that uh, massive, massively increases uh, tax compliance. Another one is maybe improving the administration for land tax, because land tax tends to be a tax that doesn't diminish the economy because you can't shrink the land. Um, and, and there, is, there is a number of other ways how to generate uh, uh, tax, uh, tax revenues. And then plus what is the tricky part uh, is taxing the di digital economy where you don't have physical residence of that companies. And this is where I claim we need international cooperation. Uh, cooperation. And I, I'm not sure if we will have a consensus of a clear statement whether uh, we should abolish any form of consumer facing taxes. Uh, maybe there, there is not a consensus to be made among 134 countries. Uh, but I believe uh, we have a number of ways how we can uh, basically tax profits of uh, uh, the digital economy uh, without uh, going into that field of consumer-facing uh, taxes. Th thank you for those questions. Um, I, I think there seems to be a sort of conflation of the consumer facing taxes and the purpose of the OECD G20 proposed tax, which is actually suggesting an alternative to that. So, I mean, the, 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 the retrogressive tax, or quite honestly, you know, the irrational tax um, that we're seeing with consumer-facing taxes in Uganda um, is because you, you're actually taxing the wrong people. <laughs> so you're trying to tax the platform, um, and you're actually taxing the end users. It has no impact on Mark Zuckerberg's bottom line. He doesn't lose a night's sleep over this, especially because the actual numbers of users in Uganda, I'm afraid, are much, much smaller than even the um, UCC says they are. So, so um, I think we really have to engage with the, this. The um, proposed uh, international tax, non-presence-based tax, is precisely an alternative that can um, you know, a global governance solution that can support um, countries where there isn't the infrastructure and where there isn't the means, I mean, quite honestly, even for the more mature economies, there isn't the means, other, through some, other than through some global agreement, um, to get those rational taxes, those productive taxes, um, uh, from from the op, you know, from the platforms in from from that country, so it seems to me that, that this is really a you know a, a very positive form of um, providing um, least developed countries, indebted countries, and quite honestly, a whole range of emerging economies, all sorts of people who can't actually get those um, you know much needed taxes um, to to be able to do so. Um, I think we also need to think about this in terms of the longer term thing. So we, I mean, at the moment it's about, and I, I also don't think the challenges of doing so are as difficult as is being suggested. I think the enforcement is difficult, um, but I think, you know, literally with big data and everything that else that goes with it, um, Google literally, with the click of a button, can tell you what revenues it's getting from advertising in those um, jurisdictions, and then, as I said, the question becomes whether you pay a, a flat rate, which if it's a global governance thing might actually be the be best way to go, or probably what is more from a, a social justice or a, a kind of national sovereignty issue, you actually pay the tax of that particular country. Um, so I think, I, I really think these are really kind of critical ways of addressing, these are the, really the only alternatives we have. And the failure, just to address the very last question, the failure of African governments to engage you know, actively in these global forums and continue to um, resort to very old sort of multilateral member state activities that have possibly not been as successful. You know, we, we need to get that kind of engagement and then you've got a real alternative for them. Um, I suppose the quid pro quo for, for a lot of um, activists and, and people who are concerned about those taxes th then being generated and, and possibly in some way creating a um, negative pact or getting, you know, being picked up somewhere else in value chains and those kinds of things um, is also that, you know, are countries that have had 
a retrogressive exploitative, um, you know, rent extractive taxes, going to be using using those for the kind of social protection we've you know we've seen, and perhaps this is where, you know, you could begin to tie in some quid pro quos. If this is a a globally agreed way of um, getting taxes from, you know, legitimate taxation for all things, then perhaps one could also tie the uses to which that tax is put, so that those t that tax is used, for example, to create, um, you know, social protection, um, you know, national incomes or national, um, you know, s safety nets that don't exist in most of our economies. And I think at a global level, that becomes even more important as we move into, um, you know, digitized online um, in, um, work where we have no control over the labor conditions of people coming online. And our early evidence suggests that we're seeing the same patterns of exploitation um, globally around people coming online, that this would be also be a way of providing social protection at a kind of global level um, for, um, you know, that, that people could then use at a national level to support the, the citizens of their country, the people in their country, not necessarily only citizens, refugees, etc. people in, the, in their country, um, in a way, you know, in a, in a very positive way. I think the concern is just that we don't, historically, they've you know, the, the social, the taxation for social protection has not always been um, evident in many of the more repressive countries or not um, socially just um, countries. Um, it's going to be a tricky one. Yeah. The, the yeah. consensus on the spending side is a tricky one in international cooperation. I, I'm, I'm hoping that the first step is, is on, the, on the revenue generation side, probably. Yeah, so clearly there's a big debate to be had still. <laughs> um, and I think if even at a global level there's that level of confusion or uncertainty, it is just as present at a national level. And we saw that um, even in the case of Uganda where on the one hand the Ministry of Finance is saying one thing, the President is saying something else, and the Ministry of ICT is saying again something different. Um, I have spotted some representation from the Ministry of ICT here, um, but I'll also add that in the wake of um, the introduction of the social media taxes in Uganda, we did have some interventions with the Ministry as well as with Facebook, um, trying to see what the way forward should be. What's the thinking behind this? Is there a way of doing it differently or removing it altogether? Um, we made a set of recommendations that was submitted to the ministry and to Facebook. N not, not much has come of it, but um, it's good to document all of these initiatives for sharing not only in Uganda but beyond to other, to other countries as well. There was also a court case um, that came up uh, after the taxes were introduced and very little has, has come of it. Again, probably as a result to the confusion that exists in the country and what to do, what, how should we go about this. I do agree with the idea that a global approach to the whole taxation framework could be helpful and a bit more transparent. It would also perhaps help with the transparency around um, the, delivery, uh, the, the delivery of the taxes collected. Um, um, social protections is a big issue that we have um, and that we're dealing with rather not too well in Uganda. But perhaps this is some a way of exploring that, if that was a route taken. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that was it from my side. Yes, yeah, so there's a court case. Um, little has come of it, but it's not completely dead. So there's still a way to push, push for it. We, we'll, we can always talk about that a bit more. Um, and yeah, um, the taxes, you know, actually, taxes are something that people would be happy to pay, but we currently have them as a grudge payment. Um, we don't want to pay them in some of our countries because we do not see where the money is going. And when you come to tax social tax, I mean, as, I mean social something as obscure as social media in in a country like Uganda, the opposition is a whole lot bigger. But it's also very unfair. We have this little country, which is doing contributing very little to the profits of um, some of these entities, but paying a much bigger price than countries or individuals in countries who generate a whole lot more profit for some of these um, entities. Um, but yeah, 
um, the, le the playing ground currently is not particularly level and the poorer countries are paying a big price, or rather the individuals in some of the poor poorer countries are paying a much bigger price, which is why it is all the more important to have a global rethink on how this all takes, takes shape. Thanks, Julia. And just to add to that, um, the case in Uganda has actually gotten a lot of international attention from human rights mechanisms. So the Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Opinion and Expression and on Freedom of Assembly and Association wrote a communication to the government of Uganda specifically about this law. I haven't checked lately. I don't know if you're up to date, if, they've, if governments responded. I think not, but no. Um, yeah. And also another rapporteur wrote um, up the case in one of his reports to the Human Rights Council. So there is international pressure. There's obviously a lot of domestic pressure from civil society, but so far, uh, I guess no change quite yet. I saw some questions in the back row um, and more questions on the side. So I'll take the two in the back and then the one on the side. Thank you very much. Very interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Carlos Rey Moreno from the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, I couldn't hear uh, Alison's uh, first uh, stretch, so maybe you, you commented on it. And uh, I, I may derail a bit from, from the tax, uh, syntax that uh, it was established in Uganda and in other countries for different reasons. But at the end, the bottom line is affordability is becoming more of an issue out of this, this tax. And um, there is a trend, an ongoing trend in, in many engagements with regulators, particularly in Africa, about how telecoms is the industry that need to contribute the most, not contribute the most, but definitely an increase on the revenue collection in one way or another uh, for the expenditure of the country, whatever it is. And uh, that certainly is having an effect on Spectrum, how Spectrum is being more and more commercialized and out of the reach of different players and how they are engaging with different, uh, not even high demand spectrum, but even other sorts of spectrum and how uh, with the different regulators that, that you speak in Uganda, in Kenya, in others, the, some of the proposals that some of us are making around uh, more public use of spectrum end up in nowhere when they, even, even the legislators, and uh, this was a private conversation yesterday, need to face the revenue authority and how the revenue authority has different, uh, it doesn't matter what the regulator says, what the ministry says, but what the revenue authority actually end up saying. So at the end of the day, I, I have the feeling that there is something around the whole fiscal policy, the whole related with corruption, related with other things, like how at the end of the day, the poor are being taxed all in all for other things, and, and, and in particular in the, in the digital economy, how they end up paying things that are not necessarily uh, made for them. So just, it's, yeah, it's a question embedded in all day, I'm sure. Uh, so just, that was my comment, thank you. Thank you, and the gentleman in the back row. So my name is Enguerrand Maric, I'm a PhD researcher in Belgium, and I had two uh, questions. I'll try to keep it brief. The first question is a more a clarification. Um, could you please clarify the link between uh, the political dissent and the taxation? Uh, was the taxation a tool as to limit the political dissent freedom of expression, or was it the contrary, the tax being first being set up and then it generated some dissent? The second aspect is a more uh, of a curiosity uh, from um, the, the, the Ugandan or Tanzanian or Benin perspective. Um, whether the idea of the value creation, which was much discussed in the BEPS project, was discussed when the tax was being set up, or was the excise duty, as in uh, Uganda, uh, the first choice, uh, or was it a uh, second choice, which it was the most easy way to enforce uh, a tax on this kind of value creation, because data are collected by platforms or other kind of social media. Thank you very much. Thank you, and there's one other question on the side here. Uh, good afternoon, I, Arthur Oyako, I'm from Uganda. I, I want to, my question really is towards uh, Juliet. Uh, Cipesa and a number of others took uh, government of Uganda to court. My issue is, do you believe the government of Uganda has any interest in, in reviewing the social media tax? 
considering that um, it only recovered about 14% of what was projected for the last financial year. And the amendment through which the social media tax came with the mobile money tax and the mobile money tax was reviewed a week later after public out outcry and yet the social media tax stayed despite the, the higher cost of collecting it. Do you believe the government of Uganda is really interested in reviewing this tax? I think just, just please go ahead and uh, respond. I think there was some directed towards Juliet, but if Michael wants. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so if I understood the first correct, uh, question correctly, um, you're asking if whether the taxes were introduced to curb dissent? Well, it depends on how you define dissent. Perhaps in Museveni's mind, dissent is anything against him, or anything, dissent, he, anything called gossip is dissent. Gossip and dissent goes hand in hand in his mind. Um, but anyway, whether it has done anything to curb that, I wouldn't believe so. People talk on offline as much as they do online. Um, it's only a fraction of the population that is actually on social media. Um, but what the content or the, rather the narrative online is not too far off from what is being said offline. So whether it has curbed dissent or opposing views, um, I, I, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't say so. It's an attempt. But um, no form of technology can, form peop can stop people from talking their mind. Um, word of mouth remains a powerful tool. Um, we've seen it come into action a whole lot on, on a couple of times in history. And if the opportunity arises to revert to word of mouth, I'm sure it will still remain a powerful tool as it has been in previous instances. Um, then you also asked on whether there was discussion around value creation before the introduction of the taxes. Um, the taxes were introduced by way of presidential directive. Um, they simply showed up. <laughs> and um, so there was no stakeholder engagement processes or anything like that. It was instructed and uh, the language around it was um, the president had called for a small fee to, you know, curb gossip online. And the Ministry of Finance came up with the 200 shillings that is charged on a daily basis to access platforms such as WhatsApp, LinkedIn, um, various VPN sites, um, Facebook, and a couple of other, uh, Instagram, for example. Um, so no, the conversation around value creation probably started happening in the aftermath but it's a bit too late at that point. And that is probably why we're seeing a bit of a gray area even in the response from the state. And it also goes back to uh, Arthur's question around um, whether the state has any interest in reviewing the social media uh, taxation um, alongside the mobile money transactions, um, or rather taxations. So, the backstory to that is when the social media taxes were introduced, mobile money fees were also increased and um, thereafter uh, the percentage for withdrawing money from a mobile money account was then reduced by half a percent. Um, but is that enough? Um, not so much because people still have issues because of the 15% um, uh, fee associated with mobile money transactions, and that is excluding withdrawals. It's a bit complicated for people who may not do mobile money transactions. Um, but to this, in, in a nutshell, there are fees that are associated with mobile money transactions, and um, the state reduced one of the fees by half a percentage, but um, for some it is still not enough. Perhaps it was their way of saying we have listened to you, but um, the value it created for users of the platforms may have not been that much because they're still left with the burden of social media taxes and still left with the burden of other fees associated with mobile money transactions. Um, so yes, we often do things re reactionary more than, pro in a rather reactionary manner than proactively and this if, is uh, something that is very, 
uh, common with the state, which makes decisions and then gets into a situation and does not know how to maneuver around it thereafter, but we are stuck with the decision that um, they have made. Thank you. So, um, you know, I think in, in a sort of much bigger discussion of, of, of this, obviously the implications, you know, as I said, it's quite important to understand this in terms of the much larger tax um, issues prior to this um, as a main form of, um, of, of, of revenue for the state, because as you were saying, you know, there's no, there's very often in many of these countries little other, um, you know, some of the countries that don't have natural resources, for example, it's a case of Uganda, a little bit of tourism, but otherwise it's the mobile operators that are, are generating any kind of income in these economies. So the issue of taxation is obviously a much bigger one, and also a much bigger one in relation to other countries, you know, with facing similar problems or not maybe, you know, to, to different extents. And, and one of the um, kind of irrational, sometimes negative, or, you know, um, issues we've seen around taxation is around, you know, spectrums and auctions and that sort of thing where, you know, the, again, the, the fiscus is kind of co totally concerned with, um, you know, um, getting the highest prices for the spectrum, and so you create artificial scarcity for the spectrum, and people pay this premium price, which is then, of course, you know, in the case of, of the UK, the um, services didn't even start off with 3G when they had those very high prices for many years because of all the money had been spent on the auctions, so they couldn't actually deliver the services. So very negative outcomes from that. But we've seen it sort of, you know, subsequently across a whole lot of um, spectrum auctions um, where even if the operators have got going, they've obviously had less money then to invest in, in network rollout, and they've also, of course, recovered that money. You know, it doesn't just go to the, to the government for the spectrum, they recover that through these very, very high prices. So you know, the, the, the balancing of these things, is, this is just another example of um, you know, counterproductive policies and um, really sort of highlighted in the, in the irrationality of the tax to go to, 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 go to the second question. That um, you know, the, the purpose of the tax is actually to, to maximize um, rents from this activity, from this instrument, in order to get the debt repayment, just assuming that that's uh, a, a serious rationale, which I think, I think it is. Yeah, we're facing a debt repayment, and this is one way of doing it. But if you were wanting to, um, you know, maximize that, you should actually be encouraging the um, operators to roll out services and be getting very high company tax that they have. In fact, the effect of this was not just a and you know, not reaching the anticipated amount um, that they'd expected to receive from the social networking taxes, which was only 14% of what they'd intended to receive. But it had a negative knock-on effect in terms of company taxes because the data usage fell so low. So the, the sort of productive contribution to rational taxes is also undermined by this process, which has a double negative effect on you know, the digital Uganda vision and, and effectively on the poor. So these are like profoundly, you know, anti-poor or non-pro-poor policies in, the, in their um, policy outcomes and their policy, um, policy impacts. And so that's why I'm just, just saying again, I think that the Global Fund then provides a, really, a serious solution because this, this is a conversation that you can have with a, um, you know, a, 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 a treasurer general of a, of a ministry or something. You know, you want money. What you're doing here, you're not getting your money, and you're having a negative effect on your poor ministries who are saying, "What are they doing? They're sort of undoing our policy, etc." If you, you know, participate in this global fund, you will have serious money to be able to do serious things, including, you know, public provisioning of um, access to. Wi-Fi and things like that that we, you know, we're struggling to provide. So I'll just put, I think, a slightly different spin on that, but kind of the same issues. So, you know, you mentioned there's the, the Revenue Authority or the Minister of Finance has some obligations and they see the mobile consumer-facing taxes as a sure form of income. So I mentioned in Uganda it's 30% of the cost of using the um, mobile is um, the taxes, the user taxes. So if you drop that, uh, demand would go up, clearly. Uh, we saw what happened to demand just with the, the smaller social media tax. 
demand would go up, and there's many studies, starting with the World Bank and others that have said for a certain percent increase in mobile broadband usage, GDP goes up by, you know, one, two percent. Um, so there's this transmission, not just the mobile operators will make more money, clearly, um, but it trickles through the rest of the economy. Now, I don't know if any studies that have linked those two to say what would be the tax increase from the GDP increase from the lower prices. But even if you had that study, it'd be very hard, I think, to convince a, a minister of finance who might be looking at a limited term to give up sure income today for a possible bigger income tomorrow. They may not be in office then. They may not be in office because they lowered the tax, um, uh, the taxes on the mobile services today. So it's a very tricky problem, I think, and I think it, you know, those studies would be good, but it's a political economy problem because the Minister of Finance doesn't have responsibility over, you know, for developing the digital economy and um, maybe not even developing the broader economy. They have a goal and the mobiles is a sure way to meet it. So Germany generated 50 billion dollars of revenue out of the 4G frequencies uh, 10 years ago. That's a huge amount of money, much more than was expected. And today you can feel it in the prices. I mean, basically prices are way above European average. At the same time, it didn't really hinder investment and it didn't, didn't really hinder adoption. So, I mean, still everybody is sort of uh, able to afford a mobile phone and, and data. Uh, so, uh, so we're just paying a bit more, but that's because it's affordable. And I think what we need to look at is at the curve of price elasticity. Essentially, how does the demand go down as the prices go up? And that's a very different curve in Germany as compared to Uganda or, or, or many other places. So, and, and uh, for, for countries that have a GDP per capita of, of maybe less than $5,000 per year, um, of course, there it really hurts, and there it's stifling the entire economy. If, if you're taxing, uh, taxing internet connectivity, that will decrease, massively decrease uh, connectivity rates. So um, I think we need to judge this uh, by, the, by the context given, and um, I think there are some interesting studies on estimating price elasticity for, for internet uh, connectivity. And, and that needs to be factored to be taken into account. When you taxing, in that case, it's not so much taxing the user, but rather taxing the, uh, the telecom operators. I mean, it's typically just a tax on the revenue of, of teleco companies that will, in turn, need to pass this cost on to the user. Thank you. I'm wondering if there's any questions from remote, moder remote participants? OK, so there's a question over here. Please go ahead. that one. Okay, my name is Eberhard Blocher from Germany, and I'll, I'm going to try to combine those different arguments. We had some uh, very extensive uh, reporting on how it's being done in, in Uganda with the um, social media tax and the um, mobile phone payment tax, and um, I'm always keen to learn from other countries, and I'm trying to put a little bit of different focus on um, what you've just said, Joliet, um, trying to adopt this, um, what you've portrayed as a negative tax in Uganda back to Germany or to Europe. I've just been wandering across the IGF village and there was a study out by the Weizenbaum Institute how social media can affect mental well-being. So I think in Germany or in many other countries, we have a big problem of people being addicted to um, social media, to Facebook or to other kinds of um, social networks. And so I was just uh, maybe um, picking up from what uh, Franz von Weizsäcker said just now on the price elasticity. I was wondering if the, it would be a solution for a German society to have this kind of Ugandan tax in Germany, to have people who want to use WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever social networks in order to reduce the usage and also to reduce those negative effects, because I do know personally many people in Germany who have negative effects by using too much Facebook and all the um, things which are being described in this paper here. So perhaps you could connect and try to learn from what Uganda has been done. But of course, we have a different base in Germany, so we're not going to 
perhaps exclude so many people from um, the internet or from communicating, but rather we, we can help uh, solve those problems which we have these days in, in Germany. Thank you. I'll try to keep it very brief. Uh, um, I think uh, I would like to pass this question on to my sister, who is specializing in uh, uh, preventing media addiction. And uh, I believe money is not the, the lever uh, that we need here, because there are some very rich families, other not so rich families, etc. And um, it's, it's more about uh, how to deal with especially children and youth and, and so on. on, on uh, it's a behavioral question more than a taxation question, I believe. And if I could, oh, I was just going to jump in on that to say, I think, I mean, this goes back to the question of whether the internet is something that should be considered, would be a syntax, something that is, um, you tax to help protect societies and people. And I think it's really hard to look at the internet as something that is harmful writ large. There's a lot of benefits from it. And to tax usage of it because it is a form of addiction and can have very negative consequences kind of discounts all the good that it can do, including you know, access to information on um, mental illness or accessing resources to help people through that. So I think it's really about the behavior rather than the use. And also, even, I'm not German, I don't know the dy dynamics here, but I know in other wealthy countries, it tends to be, there's still people who have less money who are also reliant on these things and will be harmed and excluded if you start taxing and, um, you know, it, applying it evenly across society, you're going to leave people out, even in developed nations. So I think that's another factor to consider. But Alison, I think, wanted to jump in as well. I more or less, I was just going to say the same thing. I think depending on what the rate is, it's still going to be a retrogressive tax. So it's still going to have a you know, more negative effect on the poor than the rich. The rich can just pay their way out of that syntax, whereas the poor can't, possibly. I also am just wondering if there's anyone from the private sector here who'd like to jump in and respond on any of these issues or comment. We did try to get some platforms and telcos to join without much success due to various issues, <laughs> um, but I, I don't see anyone jumping in on that. So I, I wanted to turn back to the panel to see if we could do a round of closing remarks. Um, obviously, a lot of issues have been raised around the legitimate need for states to, um, to levy taxes as a necessary evil or however you'd like to look at it. Um, obviously, there's companies who are benefiting uh, financially in dramatic ways from mobile u from usage in different countries and not paying taxes on it and ironically hold the data that would allow us to know how to calculate it. Um, and there's these um, taxes are being used to stifle free expression and dissent and um, are pushing people offline in other contexts. So my question in, um, I guess, three minutes each <laughs> is if you could uh, provide some recommendations for policymakers on how to how to approach taxation issues so that keeping in mind the legitimate interest of states to collect taxes, the um, large profit of companies, and the use of the internet to um, advance human rights and development, and economic development too. Um, we can go in any order, so please, whoever wants to jump in first. Okay, so I maintain um, taxes aren't necessarily an evil. Um, how we go about them and how we use taxes collected is something completely different. Um, but we need to do a whole lot more thinking around the taxes associated with the online arena, particularly in developing countries. The continent only has a fraction of its population online. Um, your question around uh, mental health in countries like Germany is something that we're also dealing with in many of the developing countries. Um, but do we exclude people from that? Do we um, demonize uh, social media platforms? Um, so yeah, a whole lot more thinking to work around there. But we also have an opportunity, much as um, social media platforms have quite a couple of problems, as we're seeing in many of the discussions uh, emerging at the um, forum, um, they still present quite a bit of opportunity for a continent like ours, where millions have yet to come online, um, but come online with a bit more savvy than those of us who found ourselves there at the moment. Um, so maybe a whole lot more media literacy, digital literacy is still required, and that is something that needs to be driven at a personal level, but also from a state level 
um, how do we utilize um, social media platforms for media sustainability, for media viability? Many questions around that. Should the models we use in the continent replicate those in um, the Western world? Um, and what does that mean for the use of platforms like WhatsApp, Facebook, and, and the likes? So a whole lot more thinking needs to take place around there and a whole lot more government in involvement and asking them the hard questions and trying to bring them into some of these spaces. Um, there are people within many of these governments who, are, who do have an affinity and an awareness for some of the challenges that we're facing, but the pushback even within government is very present. Um, and so that is something that we also have to navigate. It's something that we've tried to navigate as an organization. How do you get pe more people on your side um, as opposed to having one individual? Um, we see that in the number of people who do support activities such as this. We also have a forum on internet freedom in Africa and increasingly we're seeing more interest from government entities wanting to be a part of these con conversations at an African level, which is exciting. A whole lot more of them need to be in that space but it's good to see an interest and a willingness to be asked some of the hard questions and to respond to them um, with truth sometimes. Um, yes, yeah, so um, my perspective is we shouldn't be asking, afraid of asking the state the hard questions um, and we should have a whole lot more community around the work that we do in digital rights. We're still a very small group of players. Um, we still have a very small data pool. A whole lot more is needed in that respect to support some of the arguments that are emerging around um, the online arena, to support the arguments around taxation. Um, yeah, I just think that a whole lot more needs to be done and we're just tickling the surface of many of the arguments at the moment. Thank you. So, um, three minutes for this. Um, uh, social networking taxes are wrong. I, you know, I think um, we need to work very hard to get those removed and we need to look at what the alternatives are for companies to um, raise legitimate taxations for le legitimate uses. Um, I think it, just at the national level, um, what we need to do is reduce um, uh, entry costs into the market. We need to create incentives to get investments into those markets and we need to get you know, once those, um, we get more people online, we get more companies operating, we'll be able to get, you know, much better company taxes that can be used, um, you know, and we'll also see indirect benefits into the economy as well. So we can have direct, rational taxation, productive, you know, tax, taxation of productive activity um, in the market and, and, and knock-on effects. And then, as I said, I think increasingly, you know, we, 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 as more people come online, we're going to have more bigger issues around um, platforms. And platforms are about global markets. So, you know, we can't address or tax or address problems at a national level around these, these global markets. And it's going to require developing countries to, uh, you know, in, integrate, they are going to be integrated with, they like it more into these global economies. And so they're going to have to engage in these um, global forum. Um, I think, you know, Uganda or South Africa or, you know, even one of the, some of the bigger emerging economies are not going to be able to do this, uh, put this pressure, get, um, you know, um, taxes or be able to enforce taxes on these platform companies. It's going to have to happen through um, global uh, collabor collaboration, global cooperation, and it has enormous prospects for developing countries in terms of generating revenues. So, yeah, I would just... Uh kind of repeat that message and, and also just make the point uh, it's not a good idea to tax free things. You have to find a means of taxing them. And if your goal is to reduce gossip or the mental health impact, a flat tax on accessing, like in Uganda, a flat tax per day on accessing social media will block a few people from using it, but those who have paid can use it freely for the rest of the day and in fact may use it more to get their money's worth. Um, so it might not even meet those goals. And then of course how are you going to tax, tax, uh, tax usage? You can't tax it by the hour for people being on, on Facebook or what, per message on WhatsApp. Um, but I think we also owe um, to Oh, to pay more attention to those imposing the tax, particularly for revenue reasons. And it's easy to say don't impose taxes on free things or don't go after the mobile operators. 
But I do think we need to provide more data to back that up. What is the price elasticity? What is the impact on GDP of lowering a tax? Are there countries that have done this and had their tax base go up with broad-based taxes? What would happen with this uh, you know, international tax? I think if it worked, is easier to, to forecast if, if the revenues uh, are spread where the, the money is made. But I really do think we need more data so that we, you could go to a revenue authority, a minister of finance, and say, this is going to take guts, but you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. If you lower these taxes, there'll be more economic activity and, and more revenue. So I'm, I'm afraid we are just at the very beginning of this debate, and there's only very few countries that have started the, these, these efforts. And I'm afraid uh, this will happen in the coming 10 years. Uh, we will see vastly more uh, countries joining these clubs and attempting to meddle in some way or another with social media companies in order to extract revenues and, and also reach other goals um, that, that these governments have. So to prevent that, I think we need quick action on the field of international cooperation. We need, um, and in order to be successful, so we need to solve these two main uh, questions of how do we measure the revenues and how do we measure profit allocation. Um, between different countries. And then the tricky part will also, how do we get United States on board? Mm -hmm. uh, so that will be one of the major challenges and I think we need to work together in this regard. Um, and uh, so in order to, to decrease the pressure of governments going into consumer-facing taxes. So I think that's definitely uh, the way ahead. And uh, I would also put it in the larger context of industrial policies because uh, there is a number of countries that basically try to domesticate uh, certain digital economies. And you see the example of China, you would see the example of Iran, you see a couple of other examples uh, where uh, it's, it's partly an attempt to move the digital uh, economy to a domestic base, also to generate tax revenues, but also to increase, uh, to, to generate jobs, etc. And um, I believe more and more politicians will be tempted to go in such directions, even though, economically speaking, Iran hasn't been very successful in that, uh, in that endeavor. Um, um, but uh, I think uh, there will be a stronger pull if, if we don't find a good solution for, for taxing, uh, taxing international uh, IT uh, digital economy. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think you managed to raise some huge issues in the last minute, which we'd have a whole probably conference on how to get the U.S. involved <laughs> and on board with these issues. Um, yeah, and the conflation of digital economy issues and social control issues is also quite large. But thank you very much for your very um, interesting contributions and the lively discussion. Um, we're almost at time, so I'll just thank everyone and have a good afternoon.